Um, Christopher Bedford's going to be here September 22nd. He, uh, well, he's lecturing uh, as the uh, visiting fellow in journalism. But anyway, uh, on September 22nd at 2 in Plaster Auditorium, he's giving a lecture on police shootings in the media. So it might be sort of an interesting thing to go to. So anyway, it's uh, September 22nd, which, when is that? Like six days from now, right? So is that right? Okay, all right. Um, today's the 16th, right? Okay, so six days from now. Uh, so anyway, 2 p.m., Plaster Auditorium, uh, sounds like an interesting um, thing to talk about. Um, in particular, we mentioned that, um, that when we were talking about, you could also have a breakdown between criminal law and civil law. Uh, and when we get to the end, uh, one of the last chapters we do is on criminal law. Um, there was uh, a recent case that um, was settled for $12 million. I don't know if you've heard about this case where the police broke in and um, What's her name? Beth, what's her name? Beth, Brianna Beth, Taylor. Yeah, Brianna Taylor. Um, so Brianna Taylor, they just settled for $12 million civil, civil suit. Um, and now the question is, do they want to they have a criminal case? So we had mentioned that um, O.J. Simpson had, uh, had, uh, was uh, convicted in the, civil, in the civil case, or he had to make a payment in the civil case, but um, was found not guilty in the criminal case. So that might just be an interesting uh, uh, thing to, to follow up with. All right. Um, so last time we're talking about um, protecting property rights, and essentially, do you want to do it as a, an, an a, uh, injunction uh, and a, a basically a property right assignment? Or do you do it? You want to do it with damages, where you uh, what was called the uh, uh, we said that compensatory damages called legal remedy and uh, equitable damages was called. We've we've been basically talking about a con injunction where you're told you you have to fulfill this or you can't do something. Um, and so uh, one of the questions then is like we keep talking about is what's the most efficient way to assign the property right? How are you going to do that? Uh, and so here the question is, once I've assigned this property right and, I'm, and now you've violated my property right, what's, what's, what should we do in order to, uh, to make you have the incentive not to do it again, right? Uh, or we want to make sure that the property right goes to the person that values it the most. You know, we can talk about, you know, we've been talking about the Coase theorem over and over again here, right? And so the issue is, tra if transactions costs are low, I can just assign the property right and they'll trade and it'll go to the person that values it the most. But um, then you have problems, what if you have, uh, what if you have uh, transactions costs? Um, so just generally, if we think about generally how we'd like to do this, what if you have high transactions costs? Right, there's reasons that we can't bargain, right? We said there's gonna be search costs or there's gonna be bargaining costs or there's gonna be enforcement costs. Um, and so when we, we look at, the, let's say there's high transactions costs, what is the, the most efficient way to do it is generally it's gonna be damages. Generally, damages uh, are the most efficient, right? In the sense that, and what do we keep talking about efficiency? We want the right to go to the person that values it the most, okay? Um, so unless we know the party that values it the most, okay? So right? So if you got high transactions costs, what's the problem? It's going to stick with whoever you give the, the right to, okay? They're not going to be able to bargain to, to move it. So if I know who values it the most, I can use the normative Coase theorem and say, ah, I'm going to give it to, or excuse me, I'm going to use the normative Hobbes theorem. I'm going to use the normative Hobbes theorem and say, hey, 
I'm, I know who values it the most, so I'm going to give it to them. But think about how compensation works. Just through general comments here. Um, suppose that you have compensation. What does that mean? That means you violate my property right, then you have to pay me the damages. If you had damages that perfectly compensated, right? If the damages perfectly compensate, then what's going to happen is that the plaintiff is doesn't isn't going to care whether whether they whether you don't do it, right? Whether you don't intrude on their property or whether you don't fulfill the contract. Um, or they have an injunction and says, hey, you can't do that, right? Because I'm gonna get, if I'm gonna get perfectly compensated, then I won't care. You, you, you can trespass, you, you know, if it costs me $200 for you to trespass on my property, if you give me $200, I'm indifferent, right? So if damages perfectly compensate, then the plaintiff, if you think about that, the plaintiff is going to be indifferent, right? They're not going to care. But if you, if you think about it, the defendant can choose to either mitigate, that is to not do what they were supposed, you know, what, what you've told them not to do, right? Defendant can choose to mitigate or compensate, right? So we talked about compensation a little bit, but sort of briefly talked about it as being a, a, a forced transfer in a sense, in that if, if uh, I can, I can choose, if, if compensation is what you're using to protect my property right, then you could choose to go ahead and violate my property right and pay me. It was cheaper to do that for you than whatever you had to do to mitigate the, to, to mitigate the, the situation. So you're gonna, so you're gonna uh, and we'll, we'll give you an example here in a minute. Um, so if there's um, no transactions costs, so I'll put it up here. If there's no transactions costs, right, or there are low transactions costs, um, you can choose an injunction. So you can enjoin the person to not trespass on your property or to fulfill the contract that they were supposed to fulfill. Um, so, if, and, and of course, what will happen then, if there's no transactions costs, we can bargain, and the person who values the, 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 uh, the, the right the most will end, will end up with it. Um, so what you're trying to do is, so when you, when you structure the law, do you wanna provide clear property right? And we've talked about this many times, right? Do you want to do you want to provide a clear property? This is who this is who has the right here, right? This is some people's land, and they're uh, you know they've got title to the land, and you can't walk across it, okay? Or you can't uh, you can't set fire to it, right? Um, and so. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, if you were following the fires in California uh, last year, um, uh, the uh, uh, PG&E, the uh, electricity provider in California, one of the fires, a major fire, uh, got started by their, um, uh, their lines, uh, which they hadn't kept up, and it threw a spark, and it ended up causing millions of dollars of damages. In fact, so much that uh, they were looking into going bankrupt. I don't know if they actually went bankrupt or not, but, but um, so 
what, how, how do you want to do that? Do you, do you know, I mean, uh, the, the, their compensation was so high that now notice what's going on is this year, they're turning off the power, right? They're having rolling blackouts in, I don't know if you're following this, but they're having rolling blackouts in California uh, because one of the reasons is that where there's a fire situation or where there's a potential fire situation, uh, what uh, PG&E is doing is shutting down the lines um, because they were gonna be held liable for the, the fire that got started. And uh, the, one of the fires that started was somebody, uh, had a gender uh, reveal party and shot off a firework or something, and that's what started one of the fires. Okay, so it'll be interesting to sort of follow uh, how that uh, how that's being handled by the courts. But the bottom line is, if there's no transactions cost, you can choose an, an injunction, provide a clear property right, and the court doesn't the, the court doesn't have to figure out what the damages are. Notice that. What happened in um, uh, the, the recent court case, they must have figured out the damages must have been $12 million, right? Um, so they, 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 how do you figure out what the damages are, right? That's an information problem, right? I mean, sort of think through. Um, uh, figuring out the damages, that requires information. And if you go into a court case, what's gonna happen? You're gonna hire some attorney and they're gonna to try to explain, here's what the damages are, right? And uh, the judge may say, hey, that's a load of malarkey. I don't think the damages are that high. That's what, that's what the defendant's attorney is gonna be trying to do. Uh, and the plaintiff's attorney is trying to say, hey, here's all these damages. Um, so the, the, the information that's required uh, is less in terms of a, um, uh, an injunction. What you really need to know is the relative value of the right, right? So in an injunction, again, just comments here, for in an injunction, you need to know the relative value, but not the absolute. Right, so I don't need to know what the absolute value to you of the right is. I just need to know that you value it more than the other person, okay? So again, how you set the, the, the statute up uh, will depend on, is it easier to know what the relative values are or is it easier to know what the absolute, uh, absolute value of the, of the rights are? Um, again, if you pay damages, if that's what you do, if you pay damages, then I don't need to know the, the relative values. I need to know the absolute value, right? I need to know what one party's absolute value is. And that would be to the party who's given the right, okay? So the absolute value uh, to the party who's given the right. Now what will happen is, I don't know who values it the most, but I have a good way of figuring out what the absolute value is. Or, or excuse me, yeah, well I know what the absolute value is to the, I'm gonna assign the property right to this person over here. I know what the absolute value of it is to them. Now, you as the defendant can choose, okay, it's $500 is the absolute value to the person that I gave the right to. You can now choose to go ahead and violate the right or not, right? If it's worth more to you than $500, to be able to do whatever you're gonna do, violate the contract, um, and again, when we get into contract law, we'll talk more about that, or uh, to trespass on the property. Uh, if it's worth more to you than the compensatory damages, then you can do it, right? You, and, and so there's gonna be, uh, even though there's, 
high, there's high transactions costs, you guys can't come to a bargain, but the fact that we've given you compensation allows the, uh, the, the parties that, if we're using compensation uh, to protect the property right, then you can say, hey, I think that it's worth more to me than the damages I gotta pay, and so I'm gonna do it, right? So you will have you'll, have to, you'll be able to transfer that right without, without having to bargain. Right, and that's sort of the uh, important point here, um, is you can transfer the right uh, without having to bargain. And so that will be the more uh, efficient way of, uh, of doing it. So um, high transactions costs, uh, then it w if you know the relative values, then you can assign an injunction, just give the right to the person that values it the most, okay? Because that's where it's gonna stick, and that's where you want it to be. If I don't know what the relative values are, um, then, if I uh, compensation will at least get get it to happen because there's not going to be bargaining, compensation will at least get it to the person that values it the most. If I understand how, what the absolute value is to the party that's getting that's getting the right, because then the other party can choose to just violate the right and pay the compensation. Now um, that means that. Um, you have to be, it, it, notice that if you made the compensation too high, right? If you made the compensation costs higher than they actually are, okay? Um, then what would happen is it would stick with the person that didn't value it the most, or it could, right? If I make the make if I make the compensation costs sufficiently higher than the actual ones, then it might be that. You know, let's say uh, the true compensation cost would be $100, and the court has decided that it would be $200. Then what would happen is um, you would, uh, if it was worth $150 to you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't violate the right, even though the value to you was greater. So uh, again, it's, just, it's, it's really this trade-off between information costs and transactions costs, what you want to do when you, do, uh, uh, when, when you are assigning the, the method of protecting the, the property rights. Um, notice also, though, yeah? If it was too low, though, wouldn't the plaintiff have to settle for compensation if they didn't want to have to do it? Yes, if you set it too low, then you'll get it Maybe, yeah, if you set it too low, then what, the, yeah, yes, very good point. If you set it too low, then what would happen is I would violate it and buy, essentially be able to buy the right from you, even though the value to me might be less than the value to you. So it really depends on is it, are, are you capable of figuring out what the compensation costs are. Um, the, the, uh, again, it's this issue between, uh, this is about information. If I know the relative value, if I have that information, then it doesn't matter. I, uh, uh, excuse me. If I know the relative value, I'll use injunction and I'll assign the right to the, to the person that gets it, right? Because the transactions costs are high. No transactions cost, I can use injunction because it'll, it'll move to the person that does it the other way. If there's transactions costs, then what I'm going to try to do is figure out what the actual damages are. What, what, it, what are the actual damages? And if I can figure out the absolute value of the damages, then that's going to end up with an efficient outcome, right? Because you, the, the uh, um, defendant, can make that choice. I'll decide to not fulfill the contract because it's, it's going to cost me $150,000 to fulfill the contract and it's only worth $100,000 to you for me to fulfill the contract, then I'll just go ahead and pay you the $100,000, okay, in, in compensation. Um, so and just let's take a, a simple example here. Um, suppose you have, a, you have a train and a farmer, I mean that's the 
standard example of these things. So you have a train and you have a farmer. And um, the value of being able to drive along uh, and uh, you know, uh, run the train is uh, $800 uh, to uh, run the train by your property. And uh, let's say that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, that it costs four hundred dollars for a spark arrestor. So it costs four hundred dollars for a spark arrestor, and let's say that what would happen is that the um, that by throwing sparks. It costs uh, the farmer $300, okay? But they could put, if they don't do anything, the sparks are gonna cost $300 in damage. Well, but suppose that they can put in a buffer, that is they can not, uh, uh, not plow the area near the train track so they don't, they don't plow that area near the train track. And let's say that costs them $200. Well, the, in order to mitigate the damages that's, that the train will do to the farmer, they're gonna have to pay $400, okay? They have to put the Sparker restaurant. But the, the um, farmer, can reduce the damages to zero by putting in a $200 buffer, okay? So what would we like to do? We'd like to have the, uh, the train be able to have the property right, but they value it more. So if there are no transactions costs, we've got the Coase theorem sitting here, right? And the Coase theorem is going to say, well, wait a minute, here's what's going to happen. The train could pay the farmer, you know, $300, to be able to throw the sparks, and uh, the farmer would be happy with that, right? And, the, and so it would move to the party that values it the most. If I do, uh, uh, if we had high transactions costs, um, then the, if the farmer's given the right, it's gonna stick to the farmer, right? It, because I got high transactions costs, so it's gonna stick to the farmer and means that it's gonna be in the wrong spot. If what I did was I had compensation, if I made the compensation $200, farmer doesn't care, right? They'll put the buffer in, they'll get paid the $200 that they lost from having the, uh, not being able to plow that part of their field, uh, and they're good to go, right? And the train will be better off, so the train would then choose to go ahead and um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the train would go, hey, guess what? I'll throw the sparks, but I'll pay you compensation, right? I'll throw the sparks and, th and pay you the compensation. So if there's transaction costs, that bargain is going to happen by allowing for the compensatory damages because I, can, I, I don't have to bargain with you in order to make that happen, right? I'll just go, ah, drive the train, and we'll be good to go, okay? So um, if you know the relative values, then if you know the relative values, then you could do an injunction and assign it to the person that has, you know, that values it the most. If I don't know the relative values, I can, but I know somebody's absolute value, right? Then compensation will allow the other party to make that exchange. Yeah. Um, so ostensibly the compensation could be any point, right? It'd just be a question of who's getting, like the train driver's getting surplus or the... That's exactly right. Remember we talked earlier about who's getting the surplus, right? We noted that when you have a bargain, what happens? There's a cooperative surplus that's out there, and it gets split depending on what the price ends up. 
to the extent that you overestimate the compensation, but it's sufficient, you, you, you don't get it too high so that, so, that, so that the person that values it the most actually, if it's worth more to me to throw the sparks than to compensate you, as long as I, get the, I don't have the compensation high enough that it results in me not throwing sparks, we're good to go. It will determine who gets the, uh, the difference in that, in that uh, in who, who gets that cooperative surplus, how much goes to one person or the other. And so um, when you're setting up a particular situation, whether you're going to decide to use injunction relief to protect the property right or you're going to use compensatory damages, it, it depends on those two things. Transactions costs, okay? Low transactions costs, eh, do injunction, it'll go, right? And we talked about the, the, uh, the, um, the issue of it matters for the income distribution and all those other things that we talked about, but uh, it'll, from an efficiency standpoint, an injunction will work the best there. If you have high transactions costs, then it depends on whether you know the relative value or you know the absolute value. If I know the relative values, it's gonna stick with the person that, that I assign it to, but I've assigned it to the right person, so you're good to go. If I don't know the relative values, but I know the absolute values, then you're gonna to wanna to use damages, okay? So again, it depends on what the information costs are and uh, what the, um, uh, what the transactions costs are when you're deciding uh, how you're going to do, uh, how you're going to sign property rights. And again, it might be intuitive, just as I said before when we were talking about a stop sign on Milnes Road, right? High transactions cost, we're going to put the stop sign on Milnes Road rather than US 12 because we, we pretty well know that the relative value goes with the people on US 12, okay? But there might be a situation where it's pretty clear. You know what the compensation cost. You know what the damages are. Okay. I know that if you don't come in and fulfill this contract, this is uh, this is what's going to, to um, what the cost is going to be. Now, when we get into contract law, again, you know, what, what you'll notice that what this book does is it starts out, talks about a thing, and then later on it'll go into it in more detail. It says each of these chapters has property law and then topics in property law, contract law, topics in contract law. What did we already talked about? We talked about expected value, and we talked about insurance, and that kind of thing. And that just, that'll keep coming up, okay? How many were happy with the price of the book? Right? <laughs> Zero, that's gotta be pretty, pretty low price, okay? Um, but, uh, and, it, and it's, a, it's a decent book, um, and it's a quality book, uh, but it does have that feature to it that it tends to be a little bit repetitive. Uh, uh, but in any, event, in any event, one thing that we've talked about uh, already is the issue when we were talking about insurance What's a problem with insurance in terms of your mitigation? What did, what did we say? There's a, some, a term for once you're insured for something, you'll take on more risk. Moral yeah, moral hazard, right? When we talk about insurance, we said, what's one of the problems with insurance is moral hazard. That is, if you're insured against a fire, then you're going to not necessarily put it, if it perfectly compensates you, right, you're not going to spend the money to put in a smoke alarm if you're perfectly compensated. Um, and so what happens, we said insurance companies will then do things to offset that moral hazard. Uh, you'll have deductibles, co-pays, they'll reduce your premium if you do this, right? If you're a safe driver discount, I don't know if you watch uh, television commercials, but you know, you, you get a, all state will give you a safe driver discount or whatever uh, as methods to try to uh, uh, overcome this moral hazard problem. Um, so notice that You got the same thing under perfect compensation. I won't mitigate, right? 
I'll, I'll, I'll do less. I'll do less mitigation. All right, if I'm perfectly compensated, uh, I won't put in the buffer, right? Uh, and if what happens is, then you're going to pay me the $300, okay? So um, if we'll, we'll have the, the uh, uh, this, will, this is going to come up again uh, when we talk about contract law. One of the things that will happen in contract law is what's called over-reliance. That is, you'll go, oh, well, then I'll have a much larger venue than I otherwise would because the contract is saying they got to pay me for whatever, uh, you know, whatever the costs are. And so then what, when we get into contract law, we'll talk about different levels of contract law, um, you know, to, is, and to try to keep it so that you don't over rely, but it's a very similar thing. It keeps coming up in insurance, um, in compensation uh, for private property rights. And what, what's going on is when we get to contract law, that's that do you, know, you have to have compensation or do you have to fulfill the contract, right? That when we talk contract law, that's going to be the application in contract law. You have to fulfill the contract uh, rather than your train can't throw sparks. You have to fulfill the contract. And we want to make it so that however we write the contract law up, that if it's worth more to you to violate the contract than it is for me to, uh, uh, to have you fulfill the contract, we'd like you to be able to not fulfill the contract and pay the damages, right? Find the compensatory damages. Okay, so this issue will, will keep coming up. All right, so that leads us to the next section, um, which is the ownership which is in this chapter, uh, chapter uh, subsection, uh, subsection six, um, the ownership of private goods and public goods. Ownership of private goods and public goods. One of the things that we were talking about uh, early on and some of the things to think about is um, who owns things and what can you own and what can you do with them, right? We were talking about that. That's what the, the, the legal system's looking at. So let's think about who, who can own types of goods. So private goods, if we have a private good, then what's a characteristic to them? A characteristic to private goods is the rivalrous. That is, my consumption of it will affect your consumption of it, right? You and I can't, you and I can't use uh, the same vehicle at the same time, okay? Um, uh, you and I can't eat that apple at the same time, right? It, it's, it's my consumption of that apple is going to affect your consumption of the apple. Um, they also are easier to exclude, right? So we might say relatively easy to exclude. Okay, I can I can keep you from driving my car uh, by having locks on it, right? Have, and I have the key, uh, and so you know all those things that we put into the uh, production of vehicles. Um, makes it easier for me to exclude you from using my car, okay? Uh, locks on your doors, that kind of thing, right? Bolt locks instead of regular locks, right? What are those things? What are those things about? From a law and economics perspective, they're things which allow you to exclude others from using uh, private property. Now, we defined what a public good was, right? We talked about pure public good. And we said a pure public good, uh, remember, that has three characteristics to that, right? We said that it is non-rivalrous. That 
that is, my consumption of it doesn't affect your consumption of it, right? Fireworks, uh, or uh, broadcast television, whatever, okay? Uh, a lighthouse, okay? You know, unless my ship gets in between, you know, your ship and, uh, and the lighthouse, and even if it did possibly, then you can still see the lighthouse. All right, so that lighthouse is, you could have 50 ships or three ships or whatever, the lighthouse is still providing the same uh, information to people about uh, where the, uh, uh, what's going on. Um, in fact, uh, we were just out at New Buffalo. Uh, not, anybody ever been to New Buffalo? Nobody? Really? Okay, yeah, well there's a little lighthouse there. I don't know if that's a real lighthouse or not, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a lighthouse there, right? And of course, as an economist, I can't look at a lighthouse without thinking of an article I'm gonna refer to in a minute um, by Ronald Coase uh, in 1974 Journal of Law and Economics um, that uh, is how lighthouses actually were provided by the private sector. Uh, but anyway, um, they're non-rivalrous in consumption. We all get the same amount. Right, we've already talked about these three characteristics. You all get the same amount. Uh, we all get the same amount of fireworks. We all get the same amount of, uh, of uh, lighthouse light. Um, and they're difficult to exclude. They're difficult to exclude. So, and goods are on a continuum, right? Um, between purely private and purely public. Uh, I don't know if you've ever um, uh, used uh, Interstate 80 or 90 or you've driven uh, through Chicago or whatever, um, but there's tollways, right? Um, and uh, so what, what happens with a tollway is that um, I can exclude you from using the road if you don't pay the toll. Now, the enforcement cost of that might be sort of high. Um, some of the, I don't know if you've ever been on that, but sometimes they have a gate that comes down, and if you were to get to the gate and you didn't have enough money to pay the toll, then it would back up all sorts of people, right? And they'd get irritated and horns would be honking and all sorts of stuff, right? So the, 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 the enforcement mechanism might be high. Now notice, ever, anybody ever heard of Easy Pass? Yeah, well, it's a little device that you stick on your windshield, you buy it, uh, and you pay, um, uh, I think, like $25 to start with, and then they subtract it, and then when you're uh, and it, they take, take it off the $25 whenever you go through the toll, and when you get to where your toll drops below, uh, or the, the amount left on your account drops below a certain amount, they automatically charge you. Um, so anyway, the point is, is that they found a mechanism to allow you to enforce that, uh, enforce that barrier, okay? So these things, line, how rivalrous are they? Um, driving uh, into, like I said, driving into New York City at eight o'clock in the morning on Monday, the roads are more rivalrous than they are at three in the morning on a Sunday, okay? So how rivalrous are they? How difficult they are to exclude? Uh, those sorts of things are on a continuum. But a purely public good has, uh, has these, these characteristics. So who do we want to own these sorts of things? So what happens if, and, and also think about this, we've already talked about this, it's not Pareto optimal to exclude from a purely public good. Right, it, 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 this, this purely public good, right? Why would I exclude anybody? What does Pareto optimality say? Pareto optimality says I can make one person better off without making anybody else worse off. Well, by allowing you to use the road at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, it's not slowing anybody down, right? Um, it looks like a a purely public good at this point, so I can make you better off 
and not make anybody else worse off by letting you use the road. Okay? So the, uh, the, this, if you had a purely public, uh, uh, purely public good, then uh, you wouldn't want to exclude people. Now, um, let's think about public ownership of a private good. That is, you guys don't own the gorillas, okay? Um, the government, uh, uh, that, 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 that sort of like the, um, the public ownership of these things is everybody owns the gorillas, right? Well, what's the problem? If you have a private good, which is publicly owned, that is everybody's got it. How many have ever heard of this thing? The tragedy of the commons, right? Yeah, sort of a famous article, the tragedy of the commons. And what's that about? It's that if things are held in common, right? If we hold it in common, what will happen? You won't examine the added costs and, and, and added benefits. And so what will happen is things will be uh, overused, right? So if you have a pu private good that's publicly owned, then you're gonna get overuse of it, right? If, if we uh, uh, all, if, if, if uh, uh, land was owned, this, let's say we got 640 acres out here uh, in Hillsdale, and anybody can do whatever they want with it. It's owned in common, okay? Well, what'll happen is we'll all be out there trying to do stuff with it, right? Or um, I think we've talked about the movie uh, Gorillas That Are Pissed, right? Um, with Sigourney Weaver in it. What happens, have we talked about that? Haven't? Oh, it's Gorillas in the Mist, that's what it is, yeah. Gorillas in the mist. Um, why do I call it gorillas that are pissed? It's because in the end, what happens is, it's a spoiler alert, in the end, the gorillas get wiped out, right? Or at least these gorillas that she's worried about get, what do they get? They get poached, right? Well, somebody that watched it from the beginning would have said, oh, I'm an economist, these gorillas are private property held in common, what's gonna happen? They're gonna get overused, right? Uh, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if uh, you know, Buffalo Bill, right? If you don't shoot the buffalo, somebody else is gonna shoot the buffalo, okay? So even if I know that I'm gonna overuse the buffalo, I'm gonna extinct the buffalo by shooting at it, I could say, oh, gee, I think I'm not gonna shoot that buffalo that goes running by and 50 yards down the road, somebody else shoots the buffalo. And now I know that. Knowing that you're gonna shoot the buffalo 50 yards down the road, I'm gonna go ahead and shoot it, even if I know it's gonna, it's gonna cause it to be extinct, okay? And I don't know if you've been, lately on, the, on the, uh, some of the news programs, they've been talking about a recent study uh, on uh, uh, lessening of biodiversity. Uh, and that uh, we're losing all these species and this is gonna cause problems, okay? Uh, why are you losing these species? Because they tend not to be privately owned. When uh, some African countries assigned property rights to the elephant, to different, uh, actually, tribes there uh, were, were, that, uh, uh, were said that they owned the, um, the elephants, but what will happen? you'll pay money to go hunt the elephants, right? I think I was telling you about, I told you about South Africa, right? Uh, my, my trip to South Africa. Um, what did you find in South Africa, right? You find that it costs $3,000 to shoot a giraffe. Guess what? There are 20,000 acre farms out there or plantations that raise giraffes, okay? Because they, they can be privately owned if they're on your, if they're on your property. So uh, the, the point here is that if you have private property that's publicly owned, there's gonna be overuse of it and there's little incentive or less incentive for the government, less incentive for the government to monitor the use. 
in uh, the movie Gorillas in the Mist, um, there's like uh, Sigourney Weavers out there and they have four, um, uh, four agents uh, with the, I forget what country they were in, uh, their government uh, to protect thousands of acres of, uh, for the you know, gorilla that are running around on thousands of acres, right? Because the government not does, isn't gonna spend a whole lot of money protecting these things unless, but, but if you owned them, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, if Walt Disney owned the manatee, right? They, they'd make sure that you guys wouldn't be out there shooting the manatee or catching the manatee, or uh, if the manatee got sick, uh, they would have, uh, you know, they'd have some uh, biologist or whatever would be out there trying to fix the manatee and you'd be paying 50 bucks to ride the glass bottom boat to watch the manatee, okay? All right, uh, so um, next time what we're gonna do is, so on Friday, um, we are almost done with section six, which is uh, ownership of private goods and public goods, and we're gonna start um, section seven about what the owner can do with the property, and then we will work into chapter five, which is, gonna, which is topics in these, in these things. So we'll look at some of these, some of these property rights issues in, in more detail uh, in that section. Also what I'd like to do on uh, a Friday, if you could, um, figure out a time for the review session that's gonna be on Saturday, the, the Saturday the 3rd, I believe it is. It's the Saturday before the Monday because the test is on Monday the 5th, okay? So I'd like you to sort of think through uh, what's a good time to do that uh, so I can reserve, reserve the room so that we'll, we'll have a place to, uh, to do the review session. So maybe look at your calendar for that Saturday. You know, is there a, there's not a, does anybody know if there's a football game that day or does anybody know that? No? Okay. All right. So anyway, I'd like to, you know, if there's something that, that's going to be a real problem that I'd, I'd like to know that so we can pick that time. Again, I can, uh, I can uh, reserve the room for that. All right? Okay.